Imagine that you spend your days digging the frozen ground in the icy desolation of Siberia. Your thin clothes are ragged and torn. You're lucky enough to have a pair of old boots, but they don't do too much to keep out the cold, and you can feel the frostbite gnawing at your toes. Tonight, you have little to look forward to. Perhaps some soup, which is really just boiled water with a cabbage leaf floating in it. Then a few hours rest on a lice-infested bunk bed, where you're packed in like sardines with several other men who are as emaciated and broken as you are. The guard shadowed you to either sleep or die, you worthless piece of dirt. He cares not which, and you believe him. You find yourself praying that death will release you from this wretched existence as you fall into an exhausted sleep. Home is a distant memory that seems like a dream in comparison to the current hell you find yourself in. This is your life now. Now, imagine that you spend your days in the warm sunshine, working on a farm in rural America. You and your fellow workers are digging the ground and bringing in the vegetable harvest. The work is not so hard that you cannot handle it. Besides, there are plenty of breaks with decent food. Lunch might be some bread, freshly baked by the farmer's wife, a hearty stew, and some fresh fruit to finish. You pop an apple into your pants pocket for later because there are plenty to go around. Your pants, like your shirt, are well made, comfortable, and clean. You and the other men crack a few jokes in the fields and sing some folk songs to make the time go faster. You're all looking forward to tonight because the farmer has agreed to let you go into town to see a film at the local cinema. He even said he will take you in the back of his pickup truck. You've saved up enough money from your earnings working on the farm that you can afford the ticket and some popcorn too. Of course, you still miss home, but all things considered, life is surprisingly good. Given the choice, which of these options would you choose? You would choose the latter, of course. Both of these scenarios were real possibilities for Nazi soldiers at the end of World War II. But of course, they did not get a choice. Where they were sent was simply the luck of the draw. Welcome to Intrigued Mind, where today we examine the question, what happened to Nazi soldiers after World War II? In the wee small hours of October 16, 1946, Nazi party member and high-ranking SS official Ernst Kaltenbrunner was hung by the neck until dead. Along with 10 other Nazi leaders, Kaltenbrunner was executed for war crimes after the infamous Nuremberg trials. Some of his final words were, I am sorry my people were led this time by men who were not soldiers. Kaltenbrunner's final words could be interpreted in two ways. On one hand, perhaps, he was saying that Germany would have been better off if it had been led by soldiers during the war. The other possible meaning was that Kaltenbrunner was imploring the world not to blame Nazi soldiers for the countless monstrous orders they had carried out during World War II at the behest of men like himself. Perhaps Kaltenbrunner meant both. Whilst the fate of Hitler's high-ranking political and military leaders is well known, Kaltenbrunner's words certainly leads one to consider the question, what happened to these soldiers after World War II? Let's take a look. Number 1. They committed suicide. Suicide was a prominent feature of Nazi ideology. Indeed, as early as 1939, Hitler preached to the Reichstag that if he did not achieve victory, then he would not live to see the day that the Third Reich was defeated. Hitler's head of Nazi propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, offered similar sentiments when in 1945 he proclaimed on German radio that he would cheerfully throw away his life in much the same manner as Cato the Younger did when faced with the prospect of being led by Julius Caesar. It is therefore no surprise that thousands of military personnel committed suicide towards the end of or just after the end of World War II when Germany was defeated. Suicide was the best option in the minds of these people who wished to retain their self-opined glory and to avoid capture and punishment at the hands of their enemies. Many soldiers used their own weapons to kill both themselves and their families. For example, two generals by the names of Bergdorf and Krebs together shot themselves in the head with their pistols. Whilst the number of high-ranking military personnel in Hitler's army, Air Force, and Navy is documented, the number of junior personnel who died by their own hand is unknown. Number 2. They were sent to Russian work camps. In 2016, a then 90-year-old German army veteran named Walter Varda recounted his time as a POW in Russia. Captured by the Red Army in 1945, Walter recalled being sent to 23 different labor camps across Russia over the subsequent five years. The first camp he was imprisoned at on the Volga River saw 500 Germans live to see six months, while 3,000 perished. Each day, a Russian soldier would come to do a head count of the men in Walter's barracks. Walter would hold a dead man in front of him so that he would get that man's food ration. The Russian soldier would say, It's still too few. More of you must die. Walter Warden's father had joined the Nazi party in their early days, but left soon after, describing them to his wife as crooked. 
Walter was forced to join the Hitler Youth as a teenager, and then was conscripted into the German army, the Wehrmacht. In his 2016 interview, Walter spoke of many of the deprivations he experienced as a POW, having to steal melon rinds from the camp's pigs to eat, drinking water that was leaking from an engine, unloading stones from a train car that were to be used for rebuilding, contracting typhoid fever, long hard marches, numerous escape attempts, and eventual liberation in 1950. The Russian soldier who freed him told him to keep quiet about his time in the camps and said that the world could never know about what happened in the Russian labor camps. German historian Rudiger Overmans estimates that 3 million Nazi POWs were sent to Russia, with 1 million of these men dying at the hands of the Russians in these camps. Number 3. They were enlisted to rebuild France. In 1945, France had asked for 2 million Nazi soldiers to help rebuild France, but they had to make do with only 1 million. 70% of these soldiers were contained at POW camps run by the USA. The French had set up 100 POW camps across their war-torn lands. The method of their transportation was, ironically, cattle cars. However, problems arose early on when the French government realized that they did not have enough food to feed themselves with, let alone feed the Germans. 40,000 German soldiers starved to death in that first year of rebuilding, 1945, with still more perishing working in French mines or clearing landmines that the German army had left in France. Those who survived mostly worked in agriculture. Eventually, there was more food to go around, and the French and the Germans became civilized towards one another. In 1946, the French civil authorities took over the administration of German POWs from the military, which gave the soldiers the opportunity to access education. In fact, in Massif Central, a highland region in the middle of southern France, German POWs were allowed to establish libraries, workshops, and even a university. According to historian Fabian Theophilakis, the general attitude of the French towards Nazi soldiers was one of tolerance because the issue of rebuilding the country was more pressing than seeking revenge. In 1947, the US government began putting pressure on France to release all German POWs back to their native land. As per the Geneva Convention, the French government assured the US that all German soldiers would be repatriated by the end of 1948. However, France was still suffering from labor shortages and therefore offered German soldiers permanent civilian worker status in France. 137,000 of these men, mainly from Eastern Germany, accepted this offer. In 1950, between 30,000 and 40,000 Germans remained in France and intermarried with French women to produce a generation of binational children. Clearly, the Nazi soldiers who were sent to France won the lottery compared to their compatriots who were sent to the frozen labor camps of Russia. But they were still not as fortunate as those who were sent to England and America. Number 4. They helped to clean up Britain. In September 1946, one year after World War II ended, there were 402,000 German POWs being held in camps across Britain. As was the case in France, German soldiers were being put to task bringing in the harvest. They were also repairing roads, making bricks, cleaning up after VE Day celebrations, and helping build Wembley Stadium for the upcoming Olympics. These men were paid 5 cents per day for their labor, and whilst initially attracting derision from the British population, the Germans were eventually treated with kindness and respect. One German POW even described the Christmas of 1946 in a letter to the local newspaper. Invited to celebrate with a local family, in a letter he stated, In no way was I prepared for what was done for me during Christmas Day by the family. I was like a dear part of it. Where they were, I was too. What they had, I had too. And where they went, I went too. By 1947, restrictions on movement were lifted, and German POWs were allowed to visit cinemas, cafes, and attend church services. The British government knew that they had to allow the German POWs to repatriate per international law, but having this free labor force was far too useful. Thus, they held off announcing exactly when the German soldiers would be allowed to go home. Pressure from both politicians and the public gave the British government cause to practice what they preached. The British Prime Minister, Clement Attlee, began the process of repatriating 15,000 Germans per month in 1946, with the final batch being sent home in 1948. During internment, the British aimed to reorient Nazi soldiers to democratic values after years of brainwashing by the Nazi party. But some soldiers could not stomach this, seeing the hypocrisy of the situation where they were being held against their will. Britain upheld their end of the bargain and acknowledged the unalienable rights of the German POWs by allowing them the right to repatriate back to Germany. Now let's take a look at the lives of German POWs who were lucky enough to be sent to the USA. Number 5. They worked American factories and farms. 400,000 German POWs were sent to the USA via ship 
then housed at some 500 POW camps across the country, with the bulk of these camps located across the South, Southwest, Great Plains, and the Midwest regions of the country. The American authorities were concerned that if these POWs escaped from the camps, they would pose a threat to the American people. The Geneva Convention stated that forced laborers had to be paid, so the German POWs were sent into America's factories and fields to can food, mill grain, cut hay, and pick asparagus. Others delivered milk or worked as stonemasons. Besides, America was suffering under extreme labor shortages at the time, so it suited them to have these soldiers work their farms and factories. Many Americans who were children at the time simply remembered these POWs as hard-working young men who were happy to play games with them and give them candy and gum. Many of the soldiers seemed happy to be out of the war and did not necessarily identify with Nazi ideals. One prisoner likened their time in America to life in a golden cage, with the food and clothing adequate and theater, sports, games, and books all making their lives agreeable. Some German POWs even found themselves lucky enough to be housed with families of German descent so they could speak in their native tongue with them. The fact that less than 1% of these soldiers tried to escape can attest to how good their living conditions were in the USA. By the end of 1946, all of them had been sent home to Germany. Number 6. They went on to have normal lives. Those German soldiers who made it home found Germany to be a very different place to what it was when the war ended. The Potsdam Conference of 1945 saw Germany's landmass much reduced, and the repatriates found that there was little room for them in the cities in terms of work or housing. Many relocated to the rural areas of Germany and were lodged with families who did not want them. Others were subjected to yet another period of time in a camp, this time one run by the German government. As time went on and some normality resumed, the repatriated Nazi soldiers simply faded into obscurity. It is hard to feel sympathy for the fate of Nazi soldiers after Germany's defeat in World War II. There is even a certain sense of satisfaction to hear of what they were subjected to in the POW camps of Russia, and a sense of outrage to learn of the varying degrees of good living conditions that they enjoyed in France, Britain, and America. Tom Buecher, curator of the Fort Robinson Museum, told the Smithsonian in 2009 that during his research into the German soldiers who were sent to the POW camps in the USA, people thought of the POWs as Nazis, but half of the prisoners had no inclination to sympathize with the Nazi party. Fewer than 10% were hardcore ideologues. When we consider this alongside the sentiments of men like Walter Warda, it certainly gives us pause for reflection about the circumstances these Nazi soldiers found themselves in during the rise of Hitler and World War II. How normal human beings can be caught up in and then espouse hatred, vitriol, and death. It is a cogent lesson for today. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestions in the comments below.